podcast. Welcome to the Mystery College Podcast. Today we are in interviewing with Victoria Amadea. Welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. It's great to have you on the show. And um, before before we hopped on this call, you had actually gone ahead and you'd asked questions. You'd had source questions from people all around the Franz Varden community and have like a huge list of questions to get through already. I know. Um, so when I, when you invited me to the podcast, I thought it would be a great idea to see if there's anything anyone wants me to talk about. So I asked on Facebook. I also asked on TikTok. Um, I have about 10 questions. So depending on how much time we have, I can go more in depth on some things, maybe just kind of briefly cover things, but I think it'll be a great way to start. Yeah, I think that'd be a phenomenal way to start. Um, I'll go ahead and, and look up. Let's say, say the first one that that came on the list that you sent me, which is uh, is people wanted to know a bit more about your experience and in working with the Franz Varden system of med meditation, mindfulness, and spirituality. So I'm wondering, I'd love to hear more about your experience with that. What got you started with it? Yeah, so I was actually introduced to Franz Varden when I was 17 years old, maybe just two or three months before I turned 18. And I was with a school where we kind of did an intensive, me with other students, of working through step five, with step five together. But we were going through each step within two weeks, and then we're expected to come back the following week ready for the second step. So I did that, but I was very young, um, did rigorous soul mirrors. I'd done my soul mirrors probably 30 or 40 times in over a decade. Uh, I have over 500 traits now because I've done my soul mirrors uh, so many times. But um, I'm currently 37, so I started with Franz Barden when I was 17. So that was 20 years ago. But I also got introduced to several other kind of systems. Um, I was initiated into the Golden Dawn Order. I was into Gurdjieff schools. I participated in several Buddhist traditions um, and an internal esoteric uh, martial arts system from Japan. Um, but Franz Barden was kind of always in the back of my mind. And I kept revisiting Franz Barden over and over again. But I was getting stuck at step one because I was given the instruction that for the observance of thought meditation, I should master 30 seconds at a time. And it's not only every single thought, but every impression that I get. And as yeah. a sentient, so it's like, oh, I having to identify every impression in the environment. So I would just rack my brain, try and do 30, master 30 seconds at a time, a minute, et cetera. And then I would get frustrated. So after I kind of did Franz Barden on and off, and I developed some abilities in Franz Barden from other systems like transfer of consciousness. But I realized Franz Barden was the only system where the development was truly in my hands. And that's what really attracted me to it. Because in some systems and lineages, it's based on the, the instructor saying, okay, I'm ready to take you to the next level. So mm. I just started plugging into the Franz Barden community online, reading what other people were doing because I feel like when you just look at the source document of IIH, you're kind of in a blind. But if you can associate, affiliate, learn from other students of the Franz Barden tradition, what they're doing, once I did that, the, the gates completely opened for me. So for example, for the single thought uh, or the thought observation exercise, rather than doing the technique of uh, noting every single impression and thought in the order that they occurred, which had to be exacting. I just went into the observer state. So that was then my focus rather than, oh, I have to make a list and make sure I have these 60 impressions all the same order within 30 minutes. Um, so that really transformed things for me. So I kept with friends, Barden. I really sunk my teeth into that. Uh, surprisingly, within... Gosh, so I got serious with Franz Barden in 2017. So then by 17, 18. So within four years, about four years, I then started working, four or five years, I started working with uh, KTQ, uh, Key to the True Kabbalah and PME 
practice a magical invocation. And I'm still doing it. Uh, I I feel grateful that I've been able to touch all of Franz Barden's books, but I feel like with each step, with each book, there's always so much more depth you can go into with everything. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, I'm curious too, like, how was your, how's the journaling practice in regards to the Franz Barden system or your personal jur- journaling? Like, whether that's dream journaling or your practice journaling or the soul mirror work you've done. I've never heard of anyone do have that extensive a soul mirror list, which is awesome to hear over 500 entries. It's awesome. Well, and, it, and that also came from me starting Franz Barden up again over and over and over again. And my initial teacher told me, your soul mirrors will always change if you're doing heavy energetic work. So I, so I kept on being like, okay, let me just start from scratch and do it all again. Um, I haven't done my soul mirrors in a few years because I feel like I went through so many reiterations. I'm just sticking with one list for now. Uh, but I feel like journaling is very important, both in the mundane muggle world, but also, also from a magical perspective. Uh, to start, there is an energetic process that occurs when you are taking a something from the mental plane or the emotional plane and you are using a pen or a pencil to transmit it into the physical world through words. At one level, it captures that form and it brings it into the concrete. So it could be one to manifest something. It could be to discharge or dispel something. So there is a magical process that kind of goes on with journaling. Uh, But for magical journaling, one of the most potent things I find about it is keeping record of your experiences. And then when you read it, you're like, ah, I remember this. Before our call today, I decided to flip through one of my recent magical journals and I was reading through some invocation experiences I had and things spirits have told me. And I realized my everyday brain had kind of forgot about that. Like I wrote about it. It was very real and vivid at the moment but that I went on my way. And there's so much treasure you can find within your magical journal. One, to see kind of your gradual development, but with time, you can also go back to remember things, say like the invocation or say like from a accumulating the elements, what your experience was. But even that of going back and seeing those words once that you wrote before is also an activation because by seeing it and remembering it, you can then bring it into your present state and your current state of mind. Absolutely. By having it recollected in that moment, in that state or trance that you were in while you were in the process of journaling that, you get to capture the energy frequencies, you get to capture the, the feeling, the state you're in, and then you're able to reaccess that at any time through living through your journal or just by even having that journey journal in hand, then all those memories can be accessed again. And I wonder how that um, how that influences your intuition from the, or the Hermetic's perspective. Yeah, um, just real quick, I, I forgot to touch on dream journaling, uh, but real quick, I wanna say that's important as well, because I, I do keep dream journals and I found dream journals that indicated things that would happen a decade later and I, if it wasn't for me journaling that dream, I wouldn't have realized because dreaming is outside of time. Your dreams are a great treasure trove for getting information, but sometimes they can also be prophetic. Hey, they also be prophetic. Yeah. Uh, so on, on the intuition from a hermetic perspective, that was a question someone wanted me to talk a bit about on. And yeah. I, I kind of molded over and I, I made a couple notes. So what I feel like intuition from a hermetic perspective comes from the akasha but where in the akasha so from the akasha you also have your conscience your higher self and your innate knowing so this could be your resonance whether in akasha or non-dual light um where for example in akasha everything is available and things are shown as they truly are So your intuition can be tapping into Akasha 
and giving kind of a revelation. So if you have an intuition to say, oh, I shouldn't go somewhere and there ends up being a bad accident. Maybe your intuition was sensing that thing in the future that could occur and directed you away from that harm. But that could also come from your higher self and your higher guidance. Because when you're on the other side, everything speaks with energy. So even though we have a physical body, we also have an astral body and a mental body. And develop, depending on your level of development, those your astral body and mental body are still present and active within you and communicating to you whether you're cognizant of it or not. And sometimes that can come through with intuition, per se. Mm. And, and, and then that helps with how, having knowledge of, of the self, having innate knowing, connected with the higher self. Yeah, because your higher self, um, this kind of ties into the next question. Uh, so from my perspective, your higher self is the part of you that's already united with divinity. And your higher self is present with you across all time and space. Across all timelines, your higher self, which is your reflection of the macrocosm, is all-knowing, all-seeing. And although you are incarnated, and that may be doled down a bit, I've had several experiences where when I then touch my higher self, or the inner spiritual guide, I realize, oh, this presence has always been with me. It is always behind the scenes, watching, guiding, having wisdom, understanding, comprehension. So often it can also be your higher self who is guiding you through intuition or your conscience. Mm. Absolutely. And so, um, and so, and as you said, like the, the, the following question was about the inner and, and spiritual guide. So what distinctions do you make between a guide that like an inner, the inner guide versus a spiritual guide? So it's kind of like friends, like you and I talking right now, or when I, when I meant to wander, um, a lot of the heads feel like, oh, I already know you. We're already besties. Uh, and they they have positions of authority or knowledge or intel that can inform and guide you. Then your inner guide, I feel like that is your direct contact to source, God, your higher power, and that it's important to listen to your inner guide regardless because that is ultimately who you are accountable for and who is always with you. So it's like friends might give you advice and you could decide to listen to it or not, whether they have best intentions or not. It's kind of like the inner spiritual guide that you should prioritize your inner guide versus of what, you know, another spirit or even a person might tell you because at the end of the day, like your life is your life. When, when you die, you are still connected to you. You know, and the other spirits are going to be wherever they are, wherever you're doing. So I feel like the inner spiritual guide has a lot to do with being receptive and having a close relationship with that, um, but also accountable. Because ultimately, I feel like the inner spiritual guide is your true self. And that each person's true self receives some mandate from a higher realm of what they're meant to do in each lifetime, what they're meant to experience. Uh, we, I believe we have our own program of lessons and processes for our spiritual development. So while you may see other beings or spirits or beings um, on their own timeline and trajectory, I think it's important to stay in your own lane as well and appreciate other people are in their lane, but make sure that you are following your lane in your true north and your purpose. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, that, that, uh, I mean, the, the next question is about the water element. And 
I wonder how um, I wonder how those two connect and relate. Like following your true north, and 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 going with the flow of things. Yeah. So water element that was kind of a fun one. I actually had to private message the person. Do you, do you really want me to talk about the water element? And they yeah. said, <laughs> so. I don't know if this has ever been articulated elsewhere, but you know the. We already know the fire and water elements were the first that came into being, but I kind of correlate water to Akasha and then fire to non-dual light, obviously because light is a attribute of fire. But the water element, the reason I tied the water element like Akasha is, or the Tao, is because the Akasha holds everything and that's what everything comes forth from and returns to. But when we think of, say, each individual, when they were um, in their mother's womb, they were surrounded by water. And we as incarnated beings cannot survive without water. Water is life-giving. Water is life. We also need air and earth and fire to live. Uh, but water is an element I always find surprisingly enjoyable because it can have a very uh, a great cleanliness to it and a purification so you can think about like holy water or the holy grail or baptisms like water is a powerful transformation in um franz barden's system we learn how we can wash off negative energy or attributes through the water element uh, the water element is also a conductor, but it can also be very powerful um, and multidimensional. You can, you know, you can consider a single drop in an ocean. That single drop is connected to the entire ocean, and how um, over time, water can degrade rocks with continuous drops. Um, and, and a few kind of personal experiences I wanted to share with the water element is when I was like 18 or 19, I was once taking a bath and all of a sudden my astral body turned into a mermaid. It was very tangible experience. I could feel the fins and the scales and I was not actively practicing magic at that point. Like, but, you know, I, I already had kind of a, shape-shifting capacity from pre-incarnation and then later when i went to meet the undines and the water uh, the water elemental realm now and talked with some of the beings there kind of realizing oh i already had a relationship with them and i had visited with them before and um one thing that one of them conveyed to me is that through the water element all around the world they can reach me and they can connect with me so showing even the water that comes out of my tap to realize that they are always there that their presence and energy because they are rulers of that element just understanding the far reach um, are also even seeing how in the water element you can see the past present and future and that kind of ties to akasha as well because akasha contains everything that was is or will be yeah it's a really powerful analogy to from akasha to the water element from light to oh, the non-dual light to fire element i really i really like i really like those insights that you provided um and and the insights you had surrounding the water element that's fantastic um i'm wondering too uh, like the next question speaks about the presence or the great now uh would you like to do you have any thoughts on being in the present moment or experiencing the the greatness of the of being present yeah i think this is a great question that was asked so the presence for the great now i see that as when all of your beings are all of your bodies are aligned to the current moment. So at one point, they are all aligned with time, but time is also suspended. So when people are present or mindful, 
they're not preoccupied with emotions, with thoughts, you know, I need to do this, I need to do that, this is going on. They're just fully aware and abiding in what is. And the presence or the great now is talked to, talked to are talked about by sages of many traditions. You know, that may be called nirvana. In uh, the Gurdjieff system, I experience states which are called being awake. And it's where your, your senses are fully present and aware, and you look at the world in a completely different way. I could be in a grocery store and looking at someone while abiding from the great now or this awake state and just see clearly upon them what they're preoccupied with, what's going on in their life, that they're just kind of going about life in a sleeping state. So I see this kind of like the veil. It's lifting the veil a little bit. So the veil affects all of us to different degrees. It might be heavier and thick. It might be lighter for others. And some people may even think, oh, there's been experiences and times in my life where the veil was thicker, the veil was thinner. And, oh, there are times when, say, I, what, I did a hike and I looked out upon the horizon <clears throat> and you felt very present. Um, I've also found in this presence a great now, a sensation of the Garden of Eden. And, you know, I'm not too much into... Christian lore, but I just remember one time touching the state, uh, clairvoyantly, everything around me became so divine. And I felt like this is like the Garden of Eden. And the presence or the great now, I feel, at least from my personal perspective, is one gateway to see and abide with divinity. And you, you can realize depending on the quality and the quantity of your presence or being in the great now, you realize, oh, God, the creator, whatever you want to call it, is actually with me right here all the time in all things. And when I can get to this state of being, I am with that. I am one with that. There is like a, a comfort and a joy in realizing, oh, the creator is actually all here, all the time. And it's not just some ethereal things that you you hear. You're like, oh no, I'm tangibly experiencing this. I am feeling one with the divine and abiding in his creation. It's a deeply tangible experience that you feel like unified with. And and I'm curious, like, like when you're experiencing that presence or the great now, do you feel like as if like a like a like how's your mental space how's your astral space how do you feel in your body where, do, where where's your spirit present in that moment yeah i feel completely different whenever i touch that space like i have a default state of being i go to in the mundane day to day but when i do certain magic work or get into the presence or great now i feel like there's a very clear clearer channel between my higher self and my lower self and that the crown chakra is awakened and your higher presence is resonating more clearly in that moment and perceiving because sometimes in the mental body you know in the mental sphere there are tons of things that are flying around all the time and your channel to your higher self might get muddled or kind of muted for a while. But if you can activate that and have a clear channel, then your your sense of abiding is very peaceful and regal. But then you also understand, oh, this is what the Buddhist monks talk about nirvana on earth. Like this is a state of nirvana where you are feeling one with everything and that you can comprehend and understand everything even without needing to articulate it. Mm. You can understand things without articulating them. I'm wondering um, if that relates to like even like the, some of the first exercises in the Shastra Medics where you 
allow the falling and rising of thoughts. Like you're able to have experiences without labeling them or having attachment or aversion. Um, what, what are some analogies that you, that come to mind, like in regards to the practices that were you've done previously and how they help you get into the space of the, of the great moment of now? Yeah, that's a great point. Cause it also ties to the water element in a way because the water yeah. element or Taoism is about allowing things to arise and fall. You know, you don't grip, you let go. You see that everything is already accomplishing itself. So even while the mechanisms of our human nature may be busy plugging away at doing some kind of work, there is another sphere of existence where everything already is accomplishing it. So it's also about the point of registry of am I being too plugged in to say the etheric, the f- the physical, the etheric, the astral or mental plane. So a part of the part of harmony is, you know, in addition to elemental balance is kind of finding in a harmony with your consciousness. And I'm kind of going a little bit outside of language that might be used ex- explicitly in the Franz Barden system, some of my own language. But I feel like your consciousness can be cultivated to a state where you learn to ping between different registries. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So you're like, okay, if I need to be pinging into the etheric realm and dealing with etheric stuff, I do that. But then also having the freedom and flexibility to go to higher mental planes, or if you need to deal with shadow work, going into the lower planes. But all of this, one of the great things about presence or the great now is that you realize it when you get to it, that that is always with you and available regardless of your development. And that might sound kind of counterintuitive because then in initiation into hermetics, it's that, oh, you, not until the later steps do you cultivate the presence or great now. But I feel like there is such a benevolence with the great now that regardless of who you are, whether you are magically developed or not, you know, if you have an attunement and an inclination towards that, you can touch that state and be with that state without being some mighty sage or mage or magician. Um, but all of the the practices that you do prior do lead up to that. But then you can also see cross-references to, say, Buddhism. And when they talk about achieving nirvana on earth, they're not going through all these exercises that we do in Franz Barden's system. They might have their own exercises. Excuse me, just hiccuped. Um, But they are still also, even though through a different mythology, touching that presence or great now, which can be available to anyone. Beautiful. Beautiful. And I love that, as you shared it, like that that state is accessible to anyone who's willing to tune into that or has you're able to feel that frequency or come into that space, whether that's through like a mindfulness practice or exercise, that there's a lot of different roads to that great moment of now, which is highly benevolent, um, which is a really great way of phrasing it. I really appreciated that. Thank you. Oh, one, one more point on that. It's kind of like before in light, in my enlightenment, you you, I forget the saying, you wash dishes and you chop wood. (laughs) After enlightenment, you still wash wash dishes and chop wood. But that, that is also a secret. You know, it's saying it's being present. As you're washing dishes, wash the dishes. As you're chopping wood, you chop the wood. And that is a secret passage about cultivating that presence. And one of the later exercises of Franz Barden is about um, using your spirit to walk, make your body walk, cultivating, oh, it is actually my spirit that's doing everything. That is using my vocal cords or picking up a pen. But even that holds a key to presence because your spirit is connected to your higher self. So there can also be an element of theurgy where through by abiding and being consciously aware of your spirit, you can create an open channel for your higher self to come in. 
And then from that, this is kind of going on a tangent, you can then cultivate like genuine adept work. You know, theurgy being about bringing divinity on work and many traditions are about man evolving from the animal to the human, to the God man, to the God on earth. And everyone's kind of in different stages. And there's a few people on earth who've reached the God on earth and more people who've reached the man God on earth and fewer people who've reached actual human. And most of us are kind of in the mammal state, you know, where we're just going by our organic processes and desires and unconscious habits. But one of the great things about doing any kind of inner work, esoteric work, and this is back to kind of presence in the great now and your higher self is that conscious engagement to awaken yourself and activate higher forces. Um, and the Gurdjieff of system is called higher octaves and begin crystallizing them within you because we, you know, we're organic beings, but we have a lot of potential for spiritual evolution contained within our bodies since we're microcosms of the macrocosm yeah uh, it's a beautiful way of phrasing it i like the injection of the idea of octaves and the, the musicality of the gurdjieff system and that 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 we can crystallize these these more celestial states of being these macrocosm states and in, to into our microcosm that's awesome um and i think the next question really goes into that like perfectly which is like how to act open your active sigils or in other words how do you open and active activate different energetic states or signatures towards beings different awareness so the first the first thing that crossed my mind when i was asked how to open or activate sigils is the methodology is really going to depend on the person's aptitude and development so for example um there are sigils for spirits, but you can also create your own sigils that are affirmations. And these become keys in your subconscious. So, for example, Austin Osman Spare, uh, one of the things he did is when you create your own sigil for your, your own desired wish, is for people to use, um, for example, their, their semen or sexual fluids upon the sigil. And I believe in his system is that you create it once, then you put it away and you forget about it and don't think about it ever again. And then just let it kind of activate and work its forces in the background. Some people say you should have the same approach when using volts in the Franz Barton system. But when it comes to sigils for uh, spirit invocation, I think one is going to depend on whether you're a ritual magician or internal power system, and also what kind of books or grimoires you are working with. So, for example, if you are trying to invoke angels with their seals, there might already be a process and ritual corresponding candle colors, incense, music, days of the week, hour, incantations. That would help you activate that. Uh, for me, myself, I just simply look at a sigil and then I can contact the spirit. And, it, you know, that's just something I have an aptitude for. Uh, back to the journaling point, I had a journal from an entry from like 2013 when I, was, when I wasn't doing too much magic where I just got this mental filled impression that told me you can contact any spirit now. And I wrote that down. I'm like, what? I'm not trying to contact any spirits. I'm be busy being a young woman in LA or something. Um, but the thing is, things from the mental plane or the astral plane, that's outside of time. So again, to the journaling, I've seen things I've written 10, 20 years ago that may be relevant now, even though my mind is also operating within time, there are things that precede time. So with sigils, you, you can do the prescribed rituals that are available to them. You can also, uh, depending on your ability, project them into magic mirrors. Uh, sometimes I like to put my fingers over the sigil just to kind of create a physical connection before bringing them into this, uh, putting the sigil in my mental body. Sometimes I'll just look at the sigil 
and outline it with a single eye or one eye kind of drawing the line of the sigil then i just close my eyes and focus on it and then the spirit's present presence appears so it really depends kind of on your methodology i think there's several several methodologies available yeah there's several methodologies available yeah that's awesome that's awesome. Yeah, and, and there's and it's a lot of flexibility in how you can connect or open or active sigils, create sigils. Uh, like you can simply have the name and connect with it. You can follow the methods as shared in grimoires or books. Um, there's no one right way to do it, and uh, that's really eye opening for for many people. It's awesome. Um, the the next question is the uh, astral cities. Uh. Maybe like, um, I'm, I'm, would you care to elaborate on that? <laughs> yeah. So actually this one included things like about Shambhala. I kind of abbreviated it to just Asheville cities. I'll let the person know I can't go into too much detail, um, but I'll touch on it. So first there's, there's astral cities, but there's also mental sphere cities. So there's a big di differentiation to be made between them. Uh, recently I... I watched a TikTok about an atheist who had a, a near-death experience, and she went to a crystal city, and she felt like that crystal city was her home. And she was also shown um, realms for healing that spirits would stay at. And she said sometimes, depending on how much difficulty and trauma they experienced in life, they might stay there a long time uh, for the souls to heal. Um, but then when she was at the crystal city, a guide came to her and said, it's not your time to be here yet. The Crystal City, which she believed to be home. So she went back. But, okay, astral cities and mental cities. So kind of when you get out of your physical body, there is a big wide world or universe out there. There are so many different kind of beings, spirits. If you think just, for example, the Christian egregore versus the Buddhist egregore, you can go into domains that are full of Christian saints and angels and patriarchs. You can go into main domains by bodhisattvas and the different Buddhists, uh, meet Buddha. Um, there is so much vastness outside of the concrete physical world. And all of these are going to have their own registry or energy signature. So... As I sometimes tell people, depending on your your background prior into incarnation, what you do and what you do in incarnation, where you go post incarnation can widely vary. And there's several processes that I won't go into because we have more to cover. But where you ultimately end up can vary uh, kind of based on the energy that you have in your collective field. And these astral cities, um, they can look like physical cities. They can look like they're from the 17th century. They can look like they are some alien planet. They can be filled with griffins and dragons and fairies. Um, so a lot of that comes, accessibility comes a lot down towards your aptitude and your access code like your access pass. So kind of develop, depending on your your level of spiritual maturity, you may have access to certain places and not others per se. Um, and I don't mean that kind of in a harsh, your, your band way, but you also are gonna ping more towards what you may already be exposed with or you have resonance with. And just to tie back to the soul mirrors real quick, um, that's one reason why soul mirror work kind of is helpful because say you have a a negative attribute within you and when you die there is still an energy tie that you're tethered to so you can then be pulled into relevant energy post incarnation but also if you reincarnate that energy will uh, connection will be established again so in a lot of ways, soul mirror work is about untethering yourself from forces or things that might be holding you back in your greater spiritual journey. 
Yeah. Yeah. And depending on the level of maturity you have, then different realms of existence become, or you become drawn to it. Your, your higher self guides you to these different places or planes, depending on the lessons that you need. Yeah. Um, did I miss anything? No, that's great. Great. And then uh, the, the next question is about invocation versus evocation. All right. So uh, I think most people know that a little bit of the difference, but I'll just start with saying that I'm, I do not do evocation, physical evocation. I don't draw a circle. I don't try to physically bring the spirit before me. I know some people who do or that have. Um, that is, there is a ritual process there. That's kind of more outward uh, process. For me, um, as a woman, also resonates with the water element to tie that back. I feel like my nature is more inward focused. And hence, I have, I'm more interested in internal power systems, but also invocation. So when it comes to invocation or evocation of spirits, I mainly focus on bringing them um, into either my mental field or I will mentally travel to their domain. Um, occasionally, it'll come down to an astral level or sometimes I'll work with a magic mirror. Um, but one thing that I like about internal power systems versus ritual systems, and there's nothing wrong with ritual systems, is with internal power systems, you are the battery pack. You are the weapon. You are the vessel by which everything can occur magically, provided you've worked at something and you've cultivated it. Sometimes with evocation or ritual magic, you're going to need your belt and your wand and your hat and your tools and your outward uh, gestures in order to make something happen. But as I kind of touched on before about being a true adept, which I obviously am very far from, um, but I've met a few and it's, it's been very humbling and inspiring is, okay, can you be sitting on a bus and still be fully capable of doing any and every kind of magic or in the middle of, you know, a car wash line or, you know, in a line at the bank or taking your kids to school. So I feel like invocation is more potent. Uh, for example, I once shared that I was trying to invoke spirits while on a plane to England uh, because it was just like this, okay, this is going to be a challenge. There's a bunch of people around me talking. I'm high in the air. I'm sitting in a, in a, uh, a seat on an airplane. Um, and then there was a process there, like, oh, it's actually too noisy, and and okay, I have to create a buffer, a buffer around me. Okay, I can contact them, but it's muted. Waited for people to start falling asleep. I tried again. Then I was able to have a little bit more clarity uh, with the contact. But it was one of those things where I want to experience. Okay, how can I be practicing magic on the go? Mm, that's a really cool experience, and. I can definitely relate to to work, doing that on a plane, and then then having all those kind of little fumbles on the way, like, oh, okay, yeah, this might invade this person's space. Um, I'm looking above these people's crowns, and they're like, oh, okay, this, it, this energy is probably not the best one. So maybe I'll tune into something a little more mild. And it's like, oh, I can tune into this for. I can definitely tune in with this this being your energy for a few minutes, but but uh, it's it's really hard to maintain <laughs> all the distractions and the white noise and yeah. The, the, the shaking of the plan. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, so I'm wondering too, like the, the next question is about planetary influences and mysteries behind the Zodiac. Yeah. So for this one, I wanted to uh, briefly touch on the zone girdling the earth and then the planets in the Zodiac. Um, I just wanted to drop the zone girdling the earth because that's where there are 360 heads in charge of particular domains that have to do with the human condition, human development, different arts and sciences. So they are closer to the ground, not including, say, the elements, per se, and the heads of the elements. 
So they are more, most intimately close to us. But above us and around us, we have the planets. And as we know, the planets all have their own signatures and attributes, whether it be beneficent or maleficent. And the planets, if you look at the universe, as everything turns with time, space, the rotation of planets, the equinox, the solstices, Earth charts, these all have different mechanisms where, and I'll, I'll touch on this when we get to the zodiac, as you kind of zoom out, you realize everything kind of is a clockwork, you know, so there is that automatic mechanism that happens, but we can not be exclusively subject to that mechanism. You know, we can be aware of it and not be blindly moved by it. Um, but it is kind of keeping the, the cultivation and the development of earth, um, and going on in perpetuity. Uh, one thing I realized with my mental wandering, so I mental wandered with, uh, through all the planets. I first started just going on my own. I didn't want to have any spirit contact, be my guide. I am just wanted to show up, see what experiences I had, who I talked to, um, and have it kind of be my own inner personal journey. Um, and surprisingly, you know, I, I went and had some experience at different planets that I felt like this, this is no way this is real. And I'd mention it to a few magician friends and like, no, I had the same experience there. Or I'd have a spirit on one point, uh, one planet tell me, oh, go talk to this magician about this. I'm like, really? And I mentioned that, and then that magician's like, yeah, I was told the same thing. And I'm like, really? Because, you know, when you, you start mental wandering, it's it's so far out of reach from what we know in the tangible world that it's helpful to validate that I'm not being delusional about these experiences or just lost in imagination. These are things that are actually happening on the uh, mental plane. But the planets all kind of flow down and influence the Earth. Earth, you know, if you look at the tree of life, that's Malkuth. That's where everything is channeling down into. And it's the only planet in our solar system where we have physical beings that we're aware of outside of, say, microbes on other planets. So we have like animals and humans, um, which is very interesting to think about from a cosmic perspective that all of these planets are kind of working to influence the earth, but then they also have their own inclusive influences within themselves. But also when I've mental wandered, I found the planets have their own relationships with one another as well. Yeah. Um, so, um, before I go to the Zodiac, do you want to ask anything about the planets? Um, yeah, that's pretty comprehensive. Uh, I was just about to ask about the Zodiacs. Okay. <laughs> uh, so I, I have gone and worked with the Zodiac once, uh, mental wandering to all the different uh, Zodiac signs. And I um, I went through my, my journal, so I mentioned a journal, and I wrote a few notes that I had um, from that experience. And so I found that Zodiac is connecting to a higher source in God's creation, which gen then channels that energy and it cascades down. So you can kind of look like, say, imagine a chandelier above a dining room table. And the top of the chandelier, the circle is very round. And then the second layer is kind of smaller. And then you go down and smaller and smaller and smaller. So you can kind of see the zodiac as that top uh, circle on the chandelier. And you have your fixed and your mutable um, points. Maybe there are other points, but they're all part tied to the elements. And all of these uh, zodiacs have certain attributes, like the planets. So the, Z the zodiacs um, signs, one thing I have, let me find this in my notes, um, is that the all, that all zodiac constellations are will and that they meet via heads and they disseminate energy into creation. So just as there's heads in the zone for building the earth and different planets, 
the zodiac constellations also have heads that are charged with the duty of the energy signature of each respective zodiac and disseminating that into creation. And as the zodiac energy comes down, and again, this is just kind of my personal observations. I could be incorrect. Or other people have other opinions. But as the zodiac constellations come down, those then influence the planets. And then the planets go down to influence the Earth. And then Earth, we have the four elements. But then also, I saw that even zodiac signatures of energy can be found on the vital level of Earth. And it's, mm. very, it's very granular. Um, but that even the energy of a zodiac, you know, it's not staying exclusively in the higher realms. You know, it can still be found in a small flakes of etheric energy even. Yeah, um, I'm, so it's found in the small flakes of, of etheric energy. And, and I'm, I'm curious as to what degree of granularity it, it manifests. Does it manifest as like, whole objects or concepts or 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 is it more energetic and it's granular and how it manifests i think it's more energetic so if you take say example the human being and all the atoms you're made up of you are going to have deposits of zodiac and planetary signatures in your atoms again this is just my hypothesis the understanding based and also in part from your birth chart so uh, i was reading through pme today and there was one spirit that you could talk to um to find out the the karma and the path of any child to be born based on the time they're born and that helped like that kind of gave me some insight into okay the the zodiac the planets, your birth chart, these all give you an energetic imprint that you kind of have to go with. Again, you can work with that, against it, transform it, but it's kind of the parameters that are imprinted upon you. So similarly, in the atoms uh, example I gave you, maybe the atoms aren't the best example, but I wanted to give something visual. And you just think about all the floating energy that makes up you. You're going to have deposits of the zodiac and the planets but all those deposits have an intelligence no matter how quiet and minute just like your you know your lungs have the intelligence to know how to breathe and your stomach has the intelligence to know how to digest these tiny signature deposits of the elements the planets the zodiac are also resonating with you and quietly on a such, such, such quiet, slow, almost undetect level influencing you and directing you. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. And that level of granularity, how they're influencing you. And uh, yeah, that's wonderful. Uh. Yeah. Uh, one other thing, um, the last question about the planetary influences and mysteries behind the Zodiac, uh, the person asked me to talk about the Tree of Life, and I said I probably wouldn't have time, but one thing I noticed from my notes with traveling to the Zodiac was an observation that there's actually a Tree of Life for the cosmos in a higher octave above the Tree of Life that we have in our solar system. So when you think about the Big Bang and how far we currently are from where the Big Bang occurred. If you say hypothetically, spiritually directed yourself closer and closer to the Big Bang, you will find higher octaves, to use that language again, uh, spiritual evolution, growth, language, uh, laws, development. So here we have the tree of life for this solar system. Um, but if you go beyond it, and it may not be called the tree of life there, but it is a different structure, kind of similar to we have a tree of life here, but that even beyond what we have here isn't necessarily the end all be all. Like you can actually go on to even higher trees of life within the greater universe. That's super cool. That makes a lot of sense too, how you put that um, with the big bang and 
you know, the, the, the closer to the explosion you have, the, the more they have different varying degrees of consciousness that have manifested and the more time they've had to evolve. Um, so that's, that's a really cool insight. Um, and then that, that, that they have their own phase of life. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what, one, one last question I had for you that that's not on the list, but I'm curious about what's, uh, what are some ways the, you know, Francis Barney community or any type of meditation, magic, mindfulness communities can have more inclusivity towards women. Um, I love, I love that you're like, I love having more female. I'd love to have more female energy overall. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, so within, for example, Hermetics, well, within the Franz Barden tradition, you have a smaller amount of women because I feel like Franz Barden system is very rigorous. It, it requires a certain aptitude and discipline and grind that, say, you might not find with crystals and tarot. So like the crystals and tarot, the Wicca world, witchcraft world, that is more accessible to, say, females because of the energy signature they can kind of go into, you know, provides them with a different platform. But you see women also in hermetics, you know, whether it's a different form of hermetics um, or for like Thelema or Golden Dawn. But I think one thing which I appreciate is people in the community have largely been kind and welcoming to me, you know, and I don't expect that people weren't, I could just deal with that. But I think um, holding space for any woman who tries to publicly share <laughs> or engage magically, um, that might be helpful because um, as we see, for example, in the Franz Barton community, we see a lot of male leaders, but there may not be many female leaders or examples to look to. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's why I'm especially appreciative of you being on this call and the posts that you make and your website. It's, it's great at having more representation and, and, and really valuable perspective. Thank you. Yeah. And I think, um, well, one of our mutual, mutual friends has mentioned before, it's usually women with backgrounds in martial arts or hardcore ballerina training that gets into hermetics. Um, I have a background in internal martial arts. Um, so I would get beat up and like knew how to take it and you know sometimes hermetic training can be like that because you just have to force yourself and will yourself um but also find balance and fun and harmony in it um but it can be um rigorous so i think sometimes if people approach it as also like take your time everyone eventually reaches their destination um another bardian magician says like it should be fun. Like, don't pressure yourself. So I think a lot of it is also the mindset and what element you're approaching it. Like I mentioned, I was kind of coming with a lot of fire and earth uh, towards practice. Um, but even just a bit of water and air approach, um, at least until you get some balance and equanimity, um, can kind of help as well. Yeah. And is there any last pieces of advice you have to folks who are interested in this system or or perhaps uh, women who are maybe listening to this um what if they're thinking about taking the steps and and, and starting to do the work or have been doing the work yeah so the france Barton tradition definitely needs more women women so if you're a woman please uh consider practicing the system it lines everything out that you need to do step by step but also there is a lot of beauty in unlocking your your higher self and your higher abilities i think for a lot of women at least for myself having an awareness of a person you are that you may not be fully embodying in the physical world so through magical practice you are able to become one with and touch more majestic beautiful aspects of the universe say even just working one-on-one -on -one with elements but being able to astral or mental travel to other planes or planets and dimensions um there there does need to be more we female leaders not just in the physical world but also um heads in the spiritual realms as well and the work you do in this lifetime will stay with you in the lifetimes to come and if you have 
a calling towards a certain type of science or art, and not just say magic per se, but say it's zoology. Uh, magic can really help you with that as well. But magic also helps you become more of a whole embodied person. Um, but also if you have a love for the creator, the divine, it can also bring you much closer to that and have a, that intimate sacred marriage within your heart uh, with the divine. Beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing and being on the show. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye.